Hello and welcome to this week's Arab Digest podcast. I'm William Law, editor of the Digest. My guest is Dr. Elizabeth Kendall, a senior research fellow in Arabic and Islamic studies at Oxford University's Pembroke College. An expert on Yemen and on jihadist movements, her most recent paper, written for the Center for Global Policy, is titled ISIS in Yemen, Caught in a Regional Power Game. Liz, welcome to the Arab Digest podcast. Thank you. Now, in your paper, you begin by stressing the importance of context in what you aptly call the complex landscape of the Yemen war. Now, for our listeners, can you sketch in that landscape before we look at the ISIS place in it? Sure. I think it's very important to understand a little bit about the context in which ISIS and and al-Qaeda are operating. Um, Perhaps it's best to start with how did we even get here in very recent history, at least. And I think that one of the main concerns is that Yemen, as an integrated state, was always an awkward concept long before the current war. And that kind of fragmentation, that has worked to the advantage of the different militant jihad groups. So the north and the south of Yemen only emerged into their own states from smaller sultanates, sheikhdoms, an imamate in the north in the 1960s. And they only united in 1990. And they were already at war within four years. So you can see that this is a you know, long-standing trouble spot. And you know, during the 2000s, during the first decade of the century, we had a lot of regional protests And this history of discontent erupted into six wars up until 2010. So right up until the modern so-called Arab Spring Revolution swept Yemen in 2011. So there's a real shaky history of uh, integration in Yemen. And right now, though, we've obviously got this war raging. What happened was that After the so-called revolution in 2011, there was an initiative by the Gulf Cooperation Council. It looked good cosmetically, but it didn't really work. Opposition groups, the real ones, were left out. There was no transitional justice. And that didn't bode well for a, a national dialogue that followed it. The United Nations dialogue ended in 2014, but it didn't really tackle the toughest questions. So... By the end of 2014, we had this religious, tribal, political grouping known as the Houthis and considered rebels who had taken over Sana'a. And by 2015, the president had to flee to Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia entered the war, leading a coalition of Sunni Arab states. That happened, you know, over five years ago. And it's pretty intransigent. Right now, just to bring it up to date, we essentially have three competing governments in three different capitals backed by three different foreign powers. We have the officially recognised government of President Herdy that's based really mainly in Riyadh, so outside Yemen, and it's backed by Saudi Arabia and the coalition. Then we've got the Houthis, who are based in the capital, Sana'a, and they're backed, supported by Iran. And then we've got a southern transitional council. These are separatists who are based in Aden and who are backed by the United Arab Emirates. So there's a very uneasy power balance into which we have a lot of different armed tribal militias, different rivals inside those three main power blocks. And then, of course, we have ISIS and we have al-Qaeda on top of that. Yes, and then let's inject ISIS, first of all, uh, because you break their story um, in Yemen into two parts, don't you? They launch in 2014, and, and what happens? Actually, initially, they seem to be doing quite well. They have defectors from al-Qaeda. Of course, these al-Qaeda guys, they've been waiting for years for something to happen. ISIS comes along, it has a caliphate, it's 
all over the media. This is exciting. But it doesn't actually take off. And that's really interesting. I've spent a lot of time looking at why it didn't really take off. It never held territory. And I, I think there are four reasons for that. Number one, it was indiscriminate in its brutality. Uh, and that, amazingly, is actually quite different from the way Al-Qaeda tries to portray itself. So, for example, you know, Islamic State undertook a coordinated suicide mosque bombing in Sana'a in 2015, in which about 500 people were killed or injured. Uh, that lost them a lot of support, even amongst their former defectors. Secondly, their messaging was poorly attuned. It seemed foreign. And I remember showing an ISIS video to different audiences in Yemen uh, back in 2015 and listening to local commentaries on that, where they said, this, is, this just seems alien, it seems foreign. This isn't, this isn't Yemeni. Whereas another Al-Qaeda video that I showed, probably a bit of an irresponsible experiment, um, you know, they're pretty much humming along to it. Not that they were terrorists, but it, it spoke to them in a certain way. And then thirdly, ISIS had weak tribal links. Al-Qaeda had been entrenched for a long time. It understood how, how these kinds of tribal dynamics worked. And lastly, ISIS's leadership was overbearing. Yemenis really don't like that. Um, and this kind of bossy, arrogant, foreign style of leadership was constantly moaned about in their internal forums and led to some very public complaints. Gradually, we saw them diminish, therefore. So I think we could place it at about late 2016 when they ended up having to hole up in a corner of central Yemen in a place called uh, Qaifa in al Baida. And by 2017, it was really operating out of this particular location. It had been limited to this location, but then at the end of the year, in October, in October 2017, the United States launched airstrikes on its two main training camps, and it looked like it was pretty much over. I mean, Bill, there were some attacks that happened subsequently in Aden and in the south, but there are signs that these were false flagged to ISIS or at least helped along by, uh, let's say, political actors following a anti-separatist, an anti-separatist agenda, and they weren't really ISIS proper. I even saw complaints inside the ISIS groups themselves saying, you know, who are these guys? They're not us. And that brings us then to this paper that I wrote. 2018 onwards, we suddenly see a reincarnation of ISIS. The group springs back to life around a new set of leaders. And that is a really different phase. This now seems like a slightly different group. Yes, because in, in your article, you have a graph which appears to tell very much the second part of the story, who ISIS targets. Uh, in, in 2018 and 2019, it's, it's mostly AQAP, Al-Qaeda, this year, it changes with ISIS claiming that the Houthis are the target. What do you make of the claims and, and how should we situate that? Yes, well, looking at the ISIS claims is really interesting because, as you say, what happens with this resurgence, this re-emergence of ISIS in 2018, is that it's almost exclusively dedicated to targeting al-Qaeda. And we know from videos that were released of ISIS defectors giving testimonies that these guys were surprised that when they joined ISIS, the first training course they were put on was actually trying to prove that al-Qaeda were infidels and not really taking much care to talk about proclaiming the Houthis, the traditional enemy, as infidels or Westerners or agents of the Crusaders as infidels. No, it was al-Qaeda. So it looked very much like this new group was designed to lead a war against al-Qaeda. And, I mean, just to give you one statistic, the first half of last year, so in the six months of last year, 86% of ISIS operations in Yemen targeted al-Qaeda. So it's pretty overwhelming. 
And I think there are three reasons for this shift, if we analyse it. First one is obvious, it's just part of the global rivalry between ISIS and Al-Qaeda, all right. But the second one is pretty interesting. There's a lot of evidence that intelligence agencies have been trying to sow discord and create rifts in Yemen's jihad movement. We've had a whole spate of of movies released by Al-Qaeda about uh, its penetration by spies. I think up till now, uh, since about 2014, I've counted 11 of them, 11 movies, that is, and, and dozens and dozens of outed spies. But the third possibility, this is the really interesting one, is that, in fact, ISIS and Al-Qaeda have become part of the region's broader proxy conflict, that they've been harnessed by regional rivals and, of course, their domestic partners just to be used as another arm of the broader conflict. And so I guess here, you know, well, who's doing it is what you'd like to ask. But I have to be a bit careful how I word this. You know, there has long been talked about a link between part of the Yemeni government military and al-Qaeda. They've fought on the same fronts. They appear to have collaborated. There look to be links between them. And so it sort of makes sense that this latest incarnation of ISIS might have a link, therefore, with the Iran-backed Houthis. And that does seem to be borne out by local reports and would partly explain this weird shift in targeting. And and in fact, even the United Nations uh, called out a link between Islamic State in Yemen and the Houthis in a counterterrorism report that was issued in January this year. And that, you know, that kind of collaboration isn't that weird if you consider that the Houthis actually collaborated with the former president of Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who had fought six wars against them. So, you know, it's a marriage of convenience. It's about fighting a mutual enemy. But, Bill, as you say, this year, things have changed again. And we've seen a real massive switch back to targeting the Houthis. And, and, you know, how do we explain that? Well, I think, first of all, it's important to note that this switch back in targeting happened pretty much at the same time as the United Nations report called out a link with the Houthis. I think it's also very important to understand that what ISIS claims to be doing and what ISIS actually is doing might be two different things. And also that there's not very much evidence of this new targeting of the Houthis. In in, in the first half of 2020, ISIS claims that 94% of its attacks have been targeting Houthis, if, if you add them all up and work the stats as I have. But they're mostly small scale ops. They're hard to confirm. They're hard to deny. And actually, ISIS is hanging out in Houthi territory. So that says a lot in itself. I mean, finally, to to wrap to, to, to wrap up this, this sort of weird alliance, it is actually useful for both parties to portray themselves as enemies, nonetheless, because, of course, the ISIS parent organisation eagerly laps up any kind of news about ISIS in Yemen attacking uh, the supposedly Shiite Houthis. And on the other hand, the Houthis showing themselves to be targets of Islamic State. They are the wronged party. They can justify expansion into central Yemen as fighting terrorism, and they can portray themselves to the West as, as a good partner in counterterrorism. It's very interesting, and, 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 what a, and what a mix, isn't it? Now, what about AQAP? Their fortunes also ebb and flow, but right now, when you look at those two groups, who do you think holds the upper hand? Um, well, until the end of 2019... It was AQAP. It looked to be winning over ISIS. It found it easier to make common cause with local tribes. And and it actually overran several of ISIS's little camps in this region. Uh, In fact, it it released footage that it had found in these camps, allegedly found in these camps. And there, there are some horrific acts that ISIS had apparently filmed. And this footage does look genuine of 
of, of brutal acts, throwing, throwing a, a young man off a cliff, having these tiny little metal cells in which it jam-packed a human body under the blazing sun. And then also some, I guess, some funnier ones. There's one where the group ISIS is trying to pledge allegiance, re-pledge its allegiance to the, I, to, to the ISIS caliph, and uh, the, their leader just keeps being interrupted by a squawking bird. Every time he says his, his pledge, he gets interrupted by this bird and has to start again, and then he fluffs his lines. So um, these are genuine ISIS figures. So, it, it, you know, this is genuine footage. <laughs> and that kind of undermined ISIS. By the end of last year, there were only 30 of them who were photographed pledging allegiance to, to the new caliph. Uh, so that's not very many. But... Well, this year, things look to be changing again. In January, we, we saw footage of a, an open-air court that ISIS held, and there were about 90 people there, so that's tripled. We've also seen a lot of al-Qaeda defections, probably owing to leadership changes. Qasem Araymi was droned. Lots of their leaders have been droned. And there was some, uh, some opposition to the appointment of the new guy, their new leader, Khalid Batarfi. And also, it looks like Al-Qaeda has moved out of this central province, possibly because it's been co-opted to new fronts that have opened up in the south of Yemen. And so, anyway, we're seeing, we're seeing a little bit of a resurgence of ISIS at the moment, and, and that's worrying. You've touched on this already, which is the extent to which outside players are using these jihadist groups uh, but are they just simply pawns uh, in this in this game, or could they, in fact, be game changer, one of them or the other? I think that the groups currently are too small and too weakened to be a game changer at the moment. But I'm also a bit wary of treating them just as pawns. Now I think that it's tempting for political actors to treat them as pawns. They're useful, they need money, they need funding, they need weapons, uh, they need protection. So, yeah, they could make good pawns, but this can come back and bite you. And, of course, it could be working the other way around. They could be using their uh, uh, political sponsors as pawns, right? I think we have to remember that these jihad groups are actually learning organisations and they have a history of adapting to circumstance. While some of the smaller branches of... Al-Qaeda and perhaps this overall branch of ISIS might be adapting to circumstance by just joining forces with more regular militias now, they could easily resurge at the right time. I, I also feel like I should bring up here that, you know, these are not broadly popular groups in Yemen. They're really not. And so I'm quite often asked, do you think that we should negotiate with them? Should we negotiate with Al-Qaeda if they're you know, part of the conflict? And my answer is always definitely not. And I think it, that would lend them some kind of credibility. Uh, and I'll just give you one little anecdote to, to illustrate that. Uh, there was a time, uh, uh, perhaps at the height of Al-Qaeda's proto-state, uh, in that it ran out of Hadramaut in the south of Yemen in 2015, 2016, when I was out there um, and I was, I, I had a lot of, tri of companions from local tribes with me, um, armed men, and we received a visit one evening where we were holed up from some guys who were part of an Al-Qaeda branch. And they lectured us, and I recognised, of course, all their kind of rhetoric and uh, their, their rather loose theology. And everyone sat there and listened and, you know, twiddled, played with their phones and stuff. And then after they'd gone, they all fell about laughing and just like, what a bunch of ridiculous guys. You know, we were never in any danger. And, and I just thought, imagine if you start negotiating with these guys, how undermining that would be for the West and how enhancing that would be for their reputation. So... Let's not overstate. Let's not overstate their their presence and their popularity. You've spoken about negotiations. Uh, the Yemen war it grinds on and on. Uh, do you see an end in sight? Uh, if so, what steps need to happen for a peace process to at least begin? Oh, an end in sight! I wish. 
No, I don't see an end in sight. Um, you know, everyone always thinks that it's going to be a short war, don't they? Uh, we're five and a half years into this war, and really, it doesn't look like the peace preparations by the United Nations are going anywhere. Actually, I think we need an entirely fresh approach to this. Uh, one of the things would be definitely to revise, to take another look at United Nations Resolution 2216, which doesn't take account of the realities on the ground now. Um, now, definitely not saying that one needs to reward the Houthis, absolutely not. But I do think one needs to recognise that it's not realistic to say that they should just give up all their weapons and retreat to their now pulverised mountain strongholds, which is essentially what it says. I also think it would be very helpful to end the kind of patronage politics that we're seeing from Gulf countries, so where you basically pay off particular people, tribes, leaders in order to gain their support. That's very unhelpful long term. It might have short term uh, success. But uh, it, it, it ruins the economy, it, it's a very unreliable loyalty, and it just perpetuates the war by creating a, a whole war economy. And then lastly, I think there needs to be a really inclusive peace process, not just these old elites wheeled out, brought round the table. Even if they do agree, how is that going to translate into peace on the ground? People need to feel that they've got real representatives. Now, you know, I'm not talking about we need some kind of perfect democratic process to elect representatives to go to the peace talks. I'm just talking about, I guess, representation, not not necessarily democratisation. People need to feel bought in. They need to feel they can trust the people around the table who are negotiating for a peace on their behalf. And, you know, where, where do ISIS and Al-Qaeda fit into all of this? Well... They don't really. And I don't think that they need to be brought in. And I don't think that they even threaten the efforts to end the war. The threat to ending the war is much more about throwing everything in with the old elites and not bringing in the outlying regions. I think where ISIS and Al-Qaeda come in is after the end of the war. It's after peace is achieved. Their moment comes when the peace is rolled out, because there will be many disillusioned parties. There'll be many disgruntled portions of the population who feel that, that the peace doesn't reflect them. It doesn't speak to them. And that's where these jihad groups harness local grievances and try to reinvent themselves again. That's very interesting and, and, and a tad depressing, isn't it? So that either ISIS or AQAP, uh, once the peace initiative perhaps starts to show uh, some fruit, then that's the point where they would come in and try and, and wreck it. Because for them, a failed state is, is the path towards their, their dream, their goal. That's exactly right. And we see this time and again, uh, not only at the beginning of this war, but all around the region, these groups thrive in failed or failing states. Liz, thank you very much. You're so welcome. Thank you for your interest in Yemen. I, I hope it's broadly shared. It needs all the attention it can get. You've been listening to the Arab Digest podcast. My guest today was Dr. Elizabeth Kendall, Senior Research Fellow in Arabic and Islamic Studies at Oxford University's Pembroke College. We welcome your comments. If you're not already a member and you want to join the club, you can find out how by going to ArabDigest.org. And if you're a student, an academic or retired, we are now offering a new rate that amounts to a 70% discount. Check it out on ArabDigest.org. I'm William Law, editor of the Arab Digest, essential reading from independent sources.